Okay, we're live on Instagram. We're live on Facebook. Good morning, y'all. My name is Dustin Jones. This is the PTNIS Daily Show brought to you by the Institute of Clinical Excellence. Today is Wednesday, January 1, 2020. It's Jerry on Ice. We're going to bring in the new year with a bang. Hope you all had a good time last night. I was in bed at 1147. So I literally missed the ball drop by 13 minutes and I could care less. But for those that stayed up the whole time, I hope you had a good time uh, and you're, uh, you're waking up uh, bright eyed and bushy tail. Uh, so it's Wednesday, Jaron Ice. It's also Hump Day Hustling. Uh, at the time of this recording, Jeff Moore's about, about to release uh, that Hump Day Hustling email that is very, very valuable. Five bullet points, pertinent links are gonna be helpful for your practice. If you're not on that, go ahead and get on that at ptlnice.com. Now for today's content, I wanna talk about a goal of mine and hopefully our professions in 2020 of growing bolder. So if you have not watched Jeff Moore's uh, episode from this past Monday, uh, if you look up rebranding physio or physio rebrand, uh, Jeff did an absolutely uh, epic episode on just kind of his vision of what the profession should look like going forward and kind of trends that we're going to see. And I want to add a fifth one on there uh, that the we as a profession grow bolder individually as clinicians, but then as a collective group. So what is growing bolder? Growing bolder uh, is, if you were to define it, uh, which I love this, it's to defy the cult of youth to live with passion and purpose. Defy the cult of youth to live with passion and purpose. So in all reality, growing bolder is an entity. It's a business. It's a media platform. It's a podcast. It's a radio uh, show. It's a public TV show as well. It's a magazine. Uh, this organization, this media outlet is rebranding aging. Just like ICE is trying to rebrand physio, uh, they are trying to rebrand aging. And if you've listened to this podcast for any amount of time, especially a lot of the episodes that I do, I am on board with that. I, I absolutely geek out about the research on ageism and how our perceptions of aging impact our decisions and how that ultimately impacts our, our functional outcomes. Uh, that stuff absolutely fascinates me, and this book really speaks to that well. And so, like I said, it also is a book. So the Growing Boulder book, uh, written by Mark Middleton. Funny uh, story, I put this book up to uh, my, my daughter. She's 16 months, uh, and she saw Mark Middleton and said, Dada, uh, we kind of look similar. He's got some years on me, though. Uh, but Mark Middleton is an amazing individual. Um, that I had the pleasure of meeting this past summer in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the Functional Aging Institute's uh, Summit. Uh, shout out to Cody Seip, Dan Ritchie. Uh, that was a great, uh, great weekend. And Mark spoke uh, to Growing Boulder and the impact that they uh, have, have had on society. And so I want to just kind of go over some of the big things that really stuck with me uh, with this book that I'm going to take going forward. And I hope you all will consider uh, as well. I definitely recommend reading the book, but I want to give you a few of the highlights that really spoke out to me. This is probably the third book I've read on ageism and aging and perceptions of aging. Uh, so a lot of repeat material for, uh, compared to the other two, uh, but still good nonetheless. So I, I want to read that definition of cult of youth, though, just to kind of set the stage. So the, the, the tagline here, defy the cult of youth, live with passion and purpose. This is really meant for people 55 and up. Uh, however, if you're under the age of 55, you're still going to benefit tremendously, especially if you're working with people over the age of 55. So he defines the cult of youth as a belief system in which everyone who is not young is considered undesirable, unhealthy, unattractive, and without hope or merit. I want to read that one again. A belief system in which everyone who is not young is considered undesirable, unhealthy, unattractive, and without hope or merit. That, my friends, is the cult of youth. Now, does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar, y'all? Think about when you were that first year DPT student. Think about uh, when you wanted to get into the profession, when you were finally in PT school and you kind of closed your eyes and envisioned what you wanted your job to be, who you're going to work with. I can almost guarantee about 80 to 85 percent of y'all wanted to work in the busy outpatient clinic and work with some type of athletic team and work with either high school, college, maybe professional uh, athletes, young folk. That's who you wanted to work with. That's who I wanted to work with. That was the whole reason I got into this profession. And my perception of older adults 
I've definitely fell into the cult of youth, the belief system in which everyone who is not young or athletic uh, is considered undesirable, unhealthy, unattractive, and without hope or merit. Why would I spend my time working with older adults uh, who are not able to improve or progress um, because I could work with this high schooler or this college athlete and really get them back to the playing field as soon as possible? That was my mindset. And as we all know, especially if you listen to this podcast, that is utter BS. <laughs> that often... Uh, the older adults we work with stand to gain the most from our services. And I just love that he, he put a definition to it. He, he gave that line, defy the cult of youth, because that is really what we're seeing in our profession and our society as well. So in terms of some helpful things that I walked away with uh, from this book, there are a few, few points that made me uh, think and also uh, reflect on. The first one is, is my immediate reaction was I'm, I'm, in a very humble way, I'm very proud of what Christina Previtt and I have done uh, with our courses, with Modern Management of the Older Adult, Essential Foundations, uh, Advanced Concepts, it's coming down the pike in March, and our live course. Many of uh, the things that Mark Middleton spoke to, we are hitting hard in our course uh, from the clinician angle. Uh, how we change people's perceptions of aging, how that's important for us as clinicians, but also how that's important for our patients. Uh, the, the importance of vigorous high intensity exercise and how to actually uh, implement that with, with our patients, how to have a big picture of some of these other things that may not be very visible in the clinic, but have a huge impact on people's lives. We are really speaking to that well amongst many, many, many other things. Uh, but I was very happy about that because these things have big impact. It, it, they have, they have a major influence in our patients' lives, and we are speaking to that uh, pretty well. And I'm very thankful for, for Christina and, and our partnership to be able to do that. Um, now, the second thing is a, a very important point that Mark speaks to is the power of people like me. He says this over and over and over again, people like me, people like me. That is their, uh, their strategy in growing bolder and trying to influence older adults is they are using people like them and their demographic to influence their peers. All right, so just think about this. Think about, uh, good morning, Alan. It's a common scenario and something that I deal with on a regular basis is, you know, just picture yourself, whether you're the, the 25, 26-year-old new grad or you're the seasoned veteran in your mid-40s, Think about the conversations that we've had with some of our patients in maybe late 70s, 80s, even early 90s of how they need to get moving, how they need to have high intensity exercise, how they need to do X, Y, and Z, all these things. Uh, and just reflect on how that conversation went. How'd that go for you? Were you pretty effective? Was there behavior change? And I would say a lot of the times, not at all. You know, Jeff Moore always says people don't need information. They need inspiration. We need to be about it. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. That's the one factor we can control is the actions that we do. And then that can influence other people. We do need to be about it. However, <laughs> me uh, being active as a 33-year-old uh, may not necessarily inspire an 88-year-old uh, to to pick up the same activities and, and take up high intensity exercise. Uh, people like me, we need to leverage people that look like our patients that are in the same demographic to influence them. Now I understand, especially in the home health setting, uh, that is rather challenging. There's only so many ways you can get that community uh, interaction or, or the interactions with those peers or, or people like me. Uh, but there's lots of ways that we can be creative about this. I know Christina has done a great job with the Masters Athlete Collective, that uh, Instagram account, Facebook account, where she highlights folks that are achieving some pretty amazing things at many ages uh, in, in sport. They're still competitive in sport, but then they're also normal, relatable people. And she really highlights that well uh, on, on those accounts. And she'll show those pictures to some of her patients. I'm really seeing this right now with the group fitness program I'm running called Stronger Life. So right now, uh, my buddy Jeff Musgrave and I are doing uh, a fitness program, 60 and up, uh, within the CrossFit box that we go to. And one of the most powerful things is when Betty walks in, who may be new to the class, and let's say she's in her mid-70s, and then she sees Susan over there, who's in the same demographic, roughly the same height, body shape, similar situation. And Susan over there is ripping 135 pounds off the floor, uh, deadlifting. And Betty then says, huh, if she's doing it, then, then I can probably do it, right? And then she attempts something that she likely would not have attempted just coming off the street. 
I could tell, you know, Betty, all the amazing things about deadlifting and how you want to uh, be able to pick things up off the ground. It makes you a super strong and resilient person. But Susan had more of an impact on her in the three second exposure uh, just by her seeing her peer do it. So that is very, very powerful. How can we leverage that in interactions with our patients? I think of a busy outpatient clinic and scheduling. Uh, you could have, you know, an, an all star patient, if you will, be. Uh, in, the, in the clinic at the same time that you're trying to bring someone in to influence them. Uh, I, th I think about social media as well. What pictures, what videos are we sharing on our accounts? What's on your website? Uh, if you go at strongerlifehq.com, all you're going to see is people like our target demographic. That is all you're going to see uh, exercising and working out. That is a very powerful thing and Growing Boulder speaks to that really well. The second thing that he talked to uh, that I found very interesting was the health wealth connection. So in sales, many folks, you know, will talk about uh, benefits over features, benefits over features. Now, if you go on many physical therapy websites, what do you see? You see more highlights of the features rather than the benefits. So a practical example of this is benefits. You may want to say, we will get you out of pain within three visits, or we will get you out of pain quicker, whatever it may be. Uh, as compared to listing all the the lovely pieces of <laughs> of therapeutic equipment that you have, you have this brand new therapeutic ultrasound, you do dry needling, you have a squat rack, blah, 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 all these things about features rather than how that's actually going to benefit uh, the patient. Now, I have often uh, leveraged uh, benefits, but from the, st the stance of functional benefits. of your, You can be able to, to keep up with your grandkids. You'll be able to stay in your house at home. You'll be able to take your groceries from your trunk into your kitchen and not worry about those steps while you're carrying all that weight. You'll be a more robust, resilient human being. And that can speak to people pretty well. However, Mark Middleton speaks to a very major fear in our patients, and that is money, is that they are going to outlive their savings. Uh, a lot of people are, are, are retiring. They're stopping work. They're not bringing in uh, any more income other than that fixed income. And uh, their people are living longer and longer and longer. And so there is a big fear in someone, you know, reaching their 90s and even, you know, past 100. Uh, how are they going to pay for it? And so he speaks to the health wealth connection that the best investment that folks can make, especially, you know, in their 50s, but at any point in your life, the best investment you can make is in yourself and in your health. And he speaks to the financial incentive and how much money you can save by being strong, resilient, and robust. How much money you can save from having to pay the crazy monthly fees of an assisted living facility of, you know, five to seven, eight thousand dollars a month if you get as strong as possible right now. How fit will you let me get you, as Jeff Moore likes to say. And that really spoke to me because that's an angle that I, I don't always take with my patients, uh, the financial aspect. But that really speaks to a big concern and fear that they have. And Mark Middleton does a great job uh, with that in this book. Good job, Mark. Now, the last one that he does very, very well is that you know, Mark is known for kind of showing all the highlight reel, the highlight stories of, you know, the 96 year old that broke, uh, you know, the 100 meter world record or the 98 year old that went skydiving on their birthday, all that fun stuff that gets shared, you know, thousands of times that we geek out about. Uh, he does a great job of that, but he also does a good job of acknowledging reality. We are going to die. Yeah. We're, we're dying right now in, in a way, you know, this life is going to come to an end and we need to acknowledge that and we need to plan for it appropriately. And as we all know, those conversations are hard. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to reflect on it. Um, and I, I, I don't always, you know, have a lot of these conversations uh, with my, pa my patients. However, uh, we do need to have these conversations and how we can uh, help them prepare uh, in terms of their surroundings and their situation. And something that really stuck out to me that was very valuable was he mentioned three key questions that was developed by MIT's Age Lab. So MIT uh, Age Lab is, is probably one of the best labs in the world in terms of solving big issues in aging. They focus on solutions that challenge longevity. All right, that is their whole aim. They look at solutions uh, to overcome things that may challenge someone's longevity. And they determined that these three questions really speak to one of the big challenges for folks and that is being able to stay independent at home. And the way they frame these questions are so simple, but really make you think. The first one is who will change my light bulb? Ask yourself that, ask your patients that. Who's gonna change your light bulb? 
AKA, do you have a long-term home maintenance plan that will help you live in this home? But when you say who will change your light bulb, uh, that really uh, reaches a lot of those aspects and comes across in a less sharp uh, manner. Who will change your light bulb? We need to figure that out. Because if you can have your light bulb changed, you can likely have many other things done in your home. That's a great question to ask and something very pertinent, especially in the world of home health, but even for you outpatient folk as well when you're questioning someone's independence. The second one, how will I get an ice cream cone? How will I get an ice cream cone? AKA, do I have adequate transportation options to go where I want, when I want? How will I get an ice cream cone? And that is a big issue for a lot of folks. They have a difficult time getting out of their house and transportation can be a little iffy. And once they lose the ability to get out of their house and go to different things in the community, uh, that's when social isolation really starts to creep in, which is no bueno. Now, things are changing, you know, uh, Lyft, Uber, uh, uh, there's a, a share in the Jairus Facebook group about a, a grandparent specific uh, ride sharing uh, app where you can call on any type of phone. Uh, so those things are going to help with that for sure, but we need to be you know, helping our patients with that. The last one is who will I have lunch with? Who are you gonna have lunch with you know, when, when you're, you may be struggling to get out of the house or when you may lose some of your functional capacity, aka am I at risk of social isolation? So these three questions uh, that we can help our patients reflect on and we should reflect on ourselves as you know, regardless of the life stage, but these are things you wanna be thinking about uh, early on, but I, I found this very helpful and, and I'm going to be using that with some of my patients now when I'm getting them to think about planning uh, for when they may not be able to walk as well as they can or they may not uh, you know, be able to be as independent as they currently are. So that's what I got. Growing Boulder. Go read it. I'll put it in uh, you know, just a good group of, of a few other books to really speak well to aging, ageism, uh, and really how that impacts society and also us as caregivers. Mark Middleton is the man. If you uh, have not heard him speak, I would recommend you do so. Follow Growing Boulder's account. Uh, they're great. But add that to your list of goals in 2020. Grow Boulder. How can you defy the cult of youth, live with passion and purpose, but ultimately how can you help your patients do the same. All right, that's all I got, y'all. 17 minutes. I apologize. Uh, we got Modern Management of the Older Adult Essential Foundation starting next week, January 8th. We would love to have y'all in that cohort. Eight weeks online, 16 CEUs, weekly assignments, bi-weekly meetings. And we dive in uh, deep into exercise prescription for older adults. How do we scale and modify some of these big complex movements? How do we consider some of these common geriatric uh, syndromes, these clinical geriatric syndromes that plague many of our patients. How do we consider some of these psychosocial considerations? What's a good falls prevention program look like? Uh, how can we improve people's balance capacity? A lot of these things we dive into uh, pretty heavily in modern management of the older adult essential foundations. We'd love to see you. Check that email for Humday Hustling. Otherwise, I'll see y'all in a couple weeks. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.